Well now, hello everyone. You, as you can probably hear, my voice is shot because I'm full of COVID. But this amazing game that I've been waiting a very long time for, as I imagine a lot of people have, has finally released. So we're going to go and play some Kerbal Space Program. I haven't played my original KSP install for quite some time. I'll probably say close to a year. Um, but I do have something like 400 hours in it. So KSP is not new to me. I adore KSP. And as of about 20 minutes ago, Cable Space Program 2 came out. So we're going to go and play it. Let's see what we've got. Oh, we have to start a new campaign. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to need to create my own flag eventually, aren't I? I wonder if I can do one now. No, there must be a folder to do it where I can put my own logo on it, but for now. Just as we do some tutorial stuff, I think we'll um, we'll stick with some base ones. We'll leave it easy difficulty, normal difficulty even. Campaign name. Sorted. Agency name. Kerbal Space Agency. Yeah, we'll just go easy, easy. We can only do sandbox because the science mode isn't in the game yet. This is something that's got to be added and spinning Kerbal down there. Let's go and have a look. I can only apologise if I cough when I put the mic on because I'm genuinely ill. Sublime mysteries lie hidden in the darkness, like jewels never beheld. These untold treasures may soon reveal themselves due to the efforts of recently founded Kerbal Space. Oh dear. Oh my. I think that might have been the only copy of the orientation film. Hold on! Slides! Uh, somewhere! Ahem! <clears throat> Welcome to your first day running the Kerbal Space Program. This campus hosts the greatest ever gathering of astronomers, astronauts, and engineers. Lemmings. After years of focused effort, this collection of geniuses has created several very impressive buildings. We believe we have all the necessary pieces to take our first steps off the ground. The best way to advance our technologies further is to get up there and learn by doing. All we need now is somebody to show us how to put all these parts together. Well, we also need somebody to help us out with the flying. We need a lot of help, actually. That's why you're here. <laughs> My name is Paige, by the way. If you need any hints, feel free to visit me over at the training center. Everything in there is well padded, so it's a great place to get up and running. Welcome aboard. Okay. The VIP. We aren't going to need to recruit astronauts this time because it's not a career mode. Engineers have created a training program. Look at these lessons at the training center. A vehicle assembly building is where we want to be if we want to build straight away. Time warp thing looks very different. Let's have a look at the training center. So we go to build and fly rockets, planes, and rovers. Lessons take place in a simulation. Space is the place, missing the ground, orbits are weird, and orbital transfers. So I think this is going to be the bulk of where, what we're doing today. I'm going to turn the audio down just a little bit more. How do rockets work? Learn the basics of rocketry. VAB camera controls, staging a rocket, landing and recovery. Let's do a tutorial. Space is the place. <laughs> it's a very 1960s uh, NASA. So you want to get to space. 
Have you tried rockets? Rockets use fuel and engines to create thrust, which propels them forward. When a fuel tank is empty, it is dropped to stay as lightweight as possible, allowing the rocket to go even faster. These tanks, as well as other expendable parts of a rocket, are called stages. Different stages do different things. Often the first stage is very powerful, with just enough fuel to get the vehicle through the atmosphere. The second stage usually has a low thrust engine that, while not as powerful, is more fuel efficient. After dropping the heavier first stage and leaving the atmosphere, the second stage engine pushes the much lighter second stage to orbital speed. On a flight to space, the final stage parachutes back down to the surface, ideally in one piece. So these have lots of um, tutorials here because they are aiming to get KSP2 out to a wider audience of people who genuinely want to learn spaceflight, which is why they're very sort of kind of aimed at younger players. It's still very cool. Welcome to the launch pad. As you embark on your journey into rocketry, it's important to get all the crashing out of your system here in the simulator. It really cuts down on the awkward phone calls. Today, you'll be launching into the virtual skies over KSC, where you'll learn how to control a rocket. Let's learn how to rotate the flight camera. That way, you can see the lump great. You can also zoom the camera in and out. Okay, basic nice. controls. Go ahead and pick your favorite view for this launch. Your rocket is ready for launch. Every good launch starts with a big green button and lots of fire. Most bad launches do too, actually. I like how in this simulator they've like turned the um, the anti-aliasing down so everything looks pixelated. Looking good. Ascend to one thousand meters, and then we'll learn some controls. Oh, there's a fuel. Okay. kilometer up. You can still crash, but you'll have more time to correct your course if you start pointing at the ground. Let's learn some rocket controls. When flying a rocket or a plane, we have specific terms for moving. Pitch tilts your rocket's nose up and down. Nice pitch. Now pitch up until you're flying straight up. Let's move on. Yaw steers your rocket left and right. Try it now. Now yaw to the left to straighten up. Excellent. Now for the final control. Roll rotates your rocket clockwise and counterclockwise. Try it now. That's the basics of rocket flight. Feel free to experiment with the controls. Ready. I think it's just going up and up and up. The uh, launch pad looks a lot cooler though, even in this. Next tutorial. Never leave Eve. So you want to get to space. It's time to make a rocket. Good old BAB. A rocket requires four crucial components. A command module, fuel tank, engine, and parachute. Let's start by learning how to add a command module. A command module allows us to control our vessel. As long as there is at least one command module on board, our rocket will be operational. This rocket will use a command pod, which can be manned by a Kerbal, and is located in the pods category. 
or multiple kerbals. It all depends on the crew capacity of the part. So we've got several lander cans here. In fact, it looks like we've got more lander cans than we have um, command pods. So we've got three command pods and four lander cans. A load of probes, of course. There's the cockpit we were just using. And several other plane cockpits. Oh, a big rover pass as well. Like a big rover seat. Cool. For this lesson, we're going to make a small rocket. So we need a small command pod. Let's add this one. Great! It doesn't look like much, but it's a promising start. The next thing our rocket needs is a fuel tank. Fuel, or propellant, is an expendable resource used to power our vessels. Without fuel, we won't be going anywhere, let alone space. Let's look at the small fuel tanks. I've also noticed there's an um, orientation in the VAB. That's quite cool. How about that one? Rocketry Weekly calls it good enough. <laughs> How exciting. Lots of fuel tanks. Lots and lots of fuel tanks. Methane, methalox, monopropellant, xenon, and hydrogen is the new one, which is for doing things like interstellar travel for like nuclear-powered engines. I was watching the uh, videos that some of the other YouTubers have uploaded. Notice the part is once again attached to your cursor. If you place your cursor near the bottom of your command pod, you'll see it snap into place. Then left-click to attach it. Now that's beginning to look like a rocket. Well, almost. We need an engine. Here at the KSP, we have four different types of engines. Launcher, sustainer, orbital, and deep space engines. To break free of Kerbin's soupy atmosphere, we want either a launcher or sustainer engine. I personally like sustainers. What can I say? They keep me going. Onto the engines now. Now let's add the sustainer engine to the fuel tank. So, we've got all these babby engines. We need to move this window again, because it's in the way a bit. Twitch. Terrier. Another Terrier. Reliant. Swivel. Thud. Skipper. Dart. It's like an aerospike. Vector. Poodle. We know the Poodle. We know the main sail. We know the Rhino. Mammoth 2, we know. Labradoodle is a new one. They're all Metalox ones. We've got some solid rocket fuel boosters as well. There's some jet engines, monopropellant, xenon, and then hydrogen. There's the original nuclear engine from KSP-1. And then there is this thing. That looks enormous. But we want a swivel engine. Excellent! Our rocket is looking pretty great. We just need one final touch. As is, our rocket can absolutely take flight. But if we want our pilot to survive the landing, we need to attach a parachute to the top of their command pod. Looking parts now. Our one Kerbal rocket doesn't weigh much, so we only need an extra small parachute. Let's go with that one. It's got lots of different parachutes this time. RCS thrusters, stabilizers. So the uh, reaction wheels. Lights, ladders. I'm going to have a look at the other parts because I'm being nosy. Communications. We've got some of the old satellite dishes. We've got a few that are new. These we know, of course. Electrical components. Batteries, solar arrays, generators. Radiators. Oh, heat shields. Okay. Ground, aerodynamic wings. Payloads. They've got like, I know that I saw in the trailer they've got like a, um, like a SpaceX sort of opening compartment. Couplings, structures, we've done engines. Okay, utility, baby parachute. Now all we need to do is put it on top of the command pod. It won't do as much good on the bottom. Congratulations, you've just built a rocket. Are you sure you haven't done this before? Okay, there's a symmetry in our snap. You have learned how to build a rocket. Next tutorial. Are we going to fly the rocket or are we going to do something else, I wonder? As you start to build rockets, you'll want to see your designs from other angles. First, let's rotate the nice. Now this let's see like a VAB tutorial in and out. Great. Now let's pan the camera up and you can also focus your camera at a specific part. 
If you want to view see. your rocket from the top, front, or sides, switch to blueprint mode. You can change the camera's direction by selecting different... If you ever get lost in the VAV, you can always reset the camera. That's nifty. Press the home key to reset the default camera view. Nice. Ah. Now you can get at those hard-to-reach parts of your rocket. <clears throat> Neat. That's cool. The blueprint thing's really nifty. You're going to take pictures for um, handing out the ships for downloads and things. I did download lots of ships when I was playing KSP1. Next. Your rocket's ready. Let's take it out for a little hop. Let's move this rocket to a launch pad. So our staging's here now this time. There's our various action groups. Our trip planner, that's quite cool. Engineer's report. Colour manager. I imagine that's blue. Oh no, we can't change the colour. I remember seeing... Um, Who was it? I think it might have been either Matt Lowne or Scott Manley who was talking about changing the colour and you can like get it to bare metal, which I think is quite cool. We'll turn it blue for this one. Welcome to the launch pad. Today you'll be flying straight up. Your rocket should do fine without any steering inputs, but if things get out of line somehow, feel free to intervene. Where's the space bar to go? Go! she goes you've cleared the launch tower and your flight is underway let's learn about staging rockets are constructed in sections called stages each stage is designed for a different part of a mission when a stage completes its job it's dropped to shed weight on your right, you'll find the staging stack. It displays all of the functions contained in each stage. Every time you select the go button, you'll activate a new stage, starting from the bottom of the stack. We didn't put couplers in for this one. I didn't do that. The game has jumped ahead. Each stage's fuel supply is shown on a bar next to the stage. Your active stage, stage one, still has a little fuel in it. When it goes dry, you'll drop that stage by selecting Go. Your first stage is out of fuel, and all it is doing is slowing you down. To drop that weight, you're going to activate your next stage. That will activate a decoupler, which will drop your empty stage. It will also activate your next engine. Once you activate a stage, there's no going back. Ready? Hit go to lose that mess. Let's get it out over the ocean. Congratulations! You're nearly to space, and your next set of fuel tanks are empty. Now is a good time to drop them. Activate the next stage. Your capsule will now continue coasting up. All that's left to do is gaze back down at Kerbin. Wonder if you remembered to lock your car. Nice work! Here we go. <clears throat> and we can still drive. Oh, we've got Valentina. And of course we can... Um, I'm guessing EVA is probably not a good option. There's our cameras. Celestial. Oh, that one's cool. There we go. We won't do the long fall down. Let's see what else we've got to do. Your capsule has a lot of momentum. If you're curious how high up you are, take a look at your altimeter. You're so high that you can... Oh, okay, so it's just dumped us up in the atmosphere. Rocketry involves a lot of waiting between the cool explosions. You can speed up time by selecting the time warp controls at the bottom of your screen. 
Check out okay. your altimeter. You're about to start falling back down. Let's slow down and enjoy the view. Great job. You're now a master of time. Try not <laughs> to use this new power for evil. So the buttons for the time warp are the same. It's basic stuff if you're not new to KSP, but it's still good to refresh it. What goes up must come down. Wind resistance will slow down your capsule's descent, but not enough to prevent it from turning into a bunch of tiny capsules when it lands. That's why we've attached a parachute. If you deploy your parachute too early, it'll be torn off. If you deploy it too late, you'll do some unplanned underground exploration. The sweet spot for Rapid is disassembly. 20,000 and 2,000 meters. Okay, you're low enough to activate the final stage that contains your parachute. Hit go to pop your chute. Not yet. We'll wait. We've got plenty of time. We can steer this thing a bit. Okay, maybe we should open it. Nice work. The parachute will trail your capsule for a bit without fully opening. Once you've slowed down enough, it'll open all the way by itself. Your parachute is now fully deployed and slowing the capsule to a safe velocity. Congratulations! If this were real, you'd find celebratory snacks in the VAB kitchen. There we go. That's how we fly rockets. Let's go back and do some more. Missing the ground. Build and launch a rocket capable of reaching orbit. It's doing orbits. And orbital transfers is obviously going to the moon. Let's go. Missing the ground. If you want to visit space for more than a couple of minutes, you'll need to get to orbit. An object is in orbit when it's moving sideways so quickly that even as gravity causes it to fall, it keeps missing the ground. As long as that object isn't slowed down by anything, it follows the same path every time it goes around the body it's orbiting. Forever. If that object is a Kerbal, it is recommended that they bring lots of snacks. So since your goal is to move horizontally at a high speed, why not launch sideways? On Kerbin, the atmosphere is like a thick soup. You waste a lot of fuel trying to fly through it horizontally. Oh dear. That's how a lot of my launches went. Vertically, you cut through the thickest part of the atmosphere as quick as possible. Most orbital rockets begin tilting toward the horizon soon after they leave the launch pad. This maneuver, called a gravity turn, uses the planet's gravity to turn the ship and reduces the amount of fuel needed to achieve a stable orbit. When launching near the equator, your gravity turns should point toward the east since your vehicle gets a free boost from the planet's rotation. Thanks, planet! Once a vehicle is moving quickly enough that its arc will take it above the atmosphere, it shuts down its engines and coasts to space. Once it nears the top of that arc, the vehicle needs to fire its engines a second time to keep itself from falling back down to the planet. Doing this turns that arc into a nice big circle. Congratulations! You've missed the ground! I assume that was a baseball. So now we're going to build a rocket to go into orbit, I assume. <clears throat> Liking Ike. When you're making a rocket, it's often easiest to work top to bottom, and oh, each stage to carry the weight of everything above it. To give you a head start, I've already placed an upper stage. 
perfect for maneuvering in the vacuum of space. I made this, not you. It could use another, more powerful stage to push it up to space from Kerbin's surface. Let's turn this vehicle into a multi-stage rocket. Anytime we intend to drop an empty stage after using all of its fuel, we connect it to the stage above it using a decoupler. A decoupler contains explosive bolts that, when activated by a staging action, eject the attached stage away from the rest. Add that decoupler to the bottom of your rocket. We there need we to go. attach a larger, more powerful lower stage to the bottom of your rocket. To keep things simple, I've whipped up a new lower stage in another workspace. You can bring saved vehicles and other sub-assemblies into an in-progress workspace. Out in the real world, this list would show all of your saved workspaces. That's pretty cool. Here in the simulator, I'm only showing you the lower stage you need to merge. Now that the lower stage has been merged into your current workspace, you can see it next to the upper stage. Select the lower stage and connect it to the decoupler beneath the upper stage to create a single two-stage rocket. Perfect! Merging is a very powerful tool. Anytime you want to reuse a particular booster, lander, or other element from an existing rocket, merging saves you the hassle of making the same thing over and over. Neat. Space rockets sometimes need an extra boost. In a rare case of rocket scientists naming something well, these additional rocket engines are called boosters. Boosters are attached to the sides of a vehicle to keep them out of the way of the main engines. Solid fuel rockets make great boosters. They produce a very high thrust for a short time. We'll start by attaching four radial decouplers that will eject the spent boosters when they're empty. To make sure that these decouplers are evenly spaced and aligned with one another, oh, great. okay, so now we can right-click it. Part on one side of your rocket, three more evenly spaced duplicates will appear around the rocket. Go ahead and add four radial decouplers. There's our radials. Good. Now attach it as shown. Perfect. Now you've got four radial decouplers exactly where they need to be. Let's attach those solid fuel boosters. We're going to use some babby ones this Since time. Since you're still in 4x symmetry mode, simply attach this booster to one of the decouplers you just placed. That will attach copies of that booster to the remaining decouplers. Great job! You've finished your orbital rocket. You can symmetrically place up to eight parts at once, a feat that could until now only be achieved by certain sea creatures. You need nose cones. <laughs> it's bothering me. My rocketry OCD is kicking in. They need nose cones. Before you launch a rocket, you need to plan the order of your staging events. Nobody wants to start out their flight by popping their parachute, right? Most parts that can be staged are automatically assigned to stages. Their activation order can be seen in the staging stack. Yes, it can change it. when staging events occur by moving them between stages. You can also add, remove, and reorder stages. Best of all, you can do this in both the VAB and in flight. I found the nose cones, but I don't want to add them in case it breaks the tutorial. <laughs> The staging order begins at the bottom of the staging stack. You want your boosters and main engine to fire together for maximum thrust. The solid fuel boosters are currently in the second stage. If we don't change anything, the boosters will ignite late and detach themselves at the same time. This would be embarrassing for everybody, so let's move the boosters down to stage one. That's not stage one, that's stage two. There we go. Your solid fuel boosters burn very hard and very fast, so they will run out of fuel first. 
Even though your main engine and boosters will activate at the same time, you want to drop the empty boosters before you drop your main engine. You'll add a new stage above stage one to do one thing. Activate the radial decouplers to jettison your spent boosters. What is the plus icon? Oh, I see. Now move all four radial decouplers from stage four. Yeah, all done. Go. Your remaining stages are set up so that stage four will activate your orbital stage's engine. Stage five will detach the orbital stage's fuel tank when it's empty. And stage six will deploy your landing parachute. Thanks to you, this rocket is ready to fly. Cool. Next. I didn't add nose cones. <laughs> Candle. In this flight, you're going all the way to orbit. I'll walk you through the process of launching, executing a gravity turn to get moving sideways, coasting to orbital altitude, and doing a final burn at the top of your arc to establish a stable orbit. Before we begin, let's talk about the nav ball. The nav ball shows your vehicle's orientation relative to the horizon. The blue half of the ball represents the sky, and the brown half represents the ground. The level indicator at the center shows your vehicle's orientation. When you turn, the ball turns. When you roll, the ball rolls. Assuming you want your rocket pointed at the sky, you'll want to see lots of blue on the nav ball. If you get confused, remember this rhyme. If the nav ball's brown, you're going down. It happens a lot. At launch, you want all your engines at maximum thrust, which means you need to set your throttle at 100%. Your solid fuel boosters are way ahead of you on this. They have no setting other than full throttle, and they can't be shut off once they're lit. Once you hit the go button, they'll go full tilt until they run out of fuel. Still, your main engine's throttle is in your control. Nose cones. You can see your main throttle here. Left shift gradually increases your throttle. Left control gradually decreases your throttle. Z and X instantly set your throttle to 100 or 0% respectively. Left click on the throttle will set its level where you clicked. <coughs> your Yeet. fuel levels are visible within the staging stack. Right now you can see that your main engine and four boosters are all topped off and ready to rumble. It's time to go. At the start, all you need to do is fly straight up. I'll check back in with you once those boosters are empty. Good luck. Here we go. These things are shifting. <clears throat> the plumes look awesome. your gravity turn. A gravity turn uses the pull of the planet's gravity to help bend your vertical ascent into a horizontal arc. It's the first step to entering orbit. For our first flight to orbit, we're going to start our gravity turn up to where the air is thin, at an altitude of around 10,000 meters. To show you where to aim your rocket, I've placed a target marker on your nav ball. Okay. First, we need to get to 10,000 meters. You're going to yaw towards the east so that the target marker is in the center of the nav ball. Your vessel and nav ball should look like this example video if you're performing the gravity turn correctly. Everyone knows a gravity turn. She's taking a minute. Ooh, did I break it? 
I guess I shouldn't have let go of D when we were doing the gravity turn. All right. And try Before again. At launch, you can see your main throttle here. Your fuel levels are visible within the staging stack. I think I right now, waited a bit too long as well. Are all topped off and ready to rumble. It's time to go. At the start, all you need to do is fly straight up. I'll check back in with you once those boosters are empty. Good luck! All right, it's time to start your gravity turn. First, we need to get to 10,000 meters. You're going to yaw towards the east so that the target marker is in the center of the nav ball. Your vessel and nav ball should look like this example video if you're performing the gravity turn correctly. I think burns through fuel very quickly. Way to make Kerbin's gravity work for you. You're now on track to establish an orbit. Your current stage is fuel. Great job. Your rocket is on its way to orbit. As you gain experience, you can make your gravity turns more efficient by starting to tilt your rocket soon after liftoff. Adjusting course with a series of small corrections instead of one big one will leave you with a lot more fuel when you get to orbit. Turning immediately after launch requires a very stable rocket. So if you ever have trouble... Okay. So you have to do things very quickly in that one. Might throw some people off doing that. Right now, we're on a ballistic trajectory. If no further adjustments are made, your rocket will eventually fall back down to the ground. Our objective is to turn this arc into an orbit. The process of turning your trajectory into a circular orbit is called circularization. Partial credit to the rocket people on that one. It does have the word circle in it, but it's really hard to say. When planning and executing orbital maneuvers, you'll want to switch to map view, where you can see every part of your current trajectory. The blue arc passing through your vehicle is its current trajectory, <laughs> the path your rocket will follow if you don't touch the controls anymore. Our goal is to make that arc into a circular orbit. After you've coasted nearly to the top of this arc, you're going to point forward and then you're going to ignite your engine. If you time this burn right, you'll never quite get to the top of the arc as it'll keep widening in front of you until it wraps all the way around the planet. Let's break that down a little more. The top of your arc has a helpful tag in map view. It's called the apoapsis, abbreviated as AP. You're going to max out your throttle before you pass this point. We're paused at just before the apoapsis. We want to go faster in the direction we're already moving, so we need to make sure our rocket is pointed forward. There's a handy marker on your nav ball called the prograde marker. That represents your forward direction. Use the Stability Assist System, or SAS, to point your vessel at that marker. You're all lined up and ready to go. The next step is to go max throttle. It can take time for your arc to fully expand into an orbit. If you look closely at where your trajectory meets the ground, you'll see it moving toward the horizon. Once your trajectory reaches all the way around the planet, you'll see another marker on your orbit. This is the periapsis, or PE, the lowest point in your orbit. It'll always live on the opposite side of your orbit from the apoapsis, or highest point. By burning prograde near your apoapsis, you increase the altitude of your periapsis, the lowest point on your orbit. Here's the most important thing to remember about setting up an orbit above an atmosphere. Your periapsis must be higher than the atmosphere, or your rocket will start to slow down every time it dips into the upper atmosphere. On Kerbin, that means every part of your orbit must be higher than 70 kilometers. Keep your eye on your trajectory for now. Okay, your orbit is fully out of the atmosphere. Cut the throttle. You did it! You're in orbit! This is when I'd usually tell you to look under your seat in the simulator, where you'd find a delicious celebratory treat. Sadly, since the vending machine in the Astrodynamics lab broke down, it has gotten very difficult to hide snacks anywhere at KSC. 
feel free to take a moment to admire your first orbit. In a way, you've given yourself a mind snack, which is way better than the edible kind anyway. Right? <laughs> right? We have been eating Belgian buns whilst this has been going on, so technically I had a snack. There we go, that's an orbit. So that's two tutorials done, and a barking dog. So, orbits then. And then we've got orbital transfers. We're getting there. <coughs> Feels very city skylines with this Orbit music and loading bar. Weird. Remember your orbiting baseball? What if you wanted to make its orbit higher? Well, it's a baseball, so grab your bat and try to hit the ball to a higher orbit. Your first thought might be to try to deflect the ball upwards. Unfortunately, hitting the ball upward bends its orbit so that it hits the ground before it can return to you. What you need to do is hit the ball in the direction it's already moving, adding to its already high velocity. Now that you've sped the ball up, why isn't it flying any higher? It just keeps whizzing by at the same height it always did. After all, I said that making it go faster would make it go higher. What gives? The ball is actually going higher, but it's going higher on the opposite side of the planet from where you're standing. You've raised its orbit, and you've learned the first lesson of orbital maneuvering. Your actions affect the opposite side of your orbit. Weird, huh? So your ball is moving faster, but it's still passing you at the same height. How do you get its orbit higher on this side of the planet? Now that you know how changes in velocity affect the other side of your orbit, you've got all you need. By adding velocity to the ball at the highest point in its orbit, you raise the lowest point in its orbit and make it circular again. Next. What about raising periapsis and apoapsis? An equatorial orbit is good, but if you want to travel beyond Kerbin, you will need to manipulate your orbit. Let's start with something simple, expanding an orbit. We do that by increasing the value of our apoapsis. Let's get a good view. Remember how you circularized your orbit by increasing your forward velocity? To raise your orbit, you'll just do more of the same. It's time to burn prograde. Now that we're pointed the right way, we can increase the throttle and watch our orbit expand. Oh, we're not really at the right points to do it, but never mind. Cut the throttle. If you overdo it, you'll leave Kerbin's orbit entirely. Nice. That maneuver raised our orbit on the other side of Kerbin, so we will enter high orbit there. Waiting to reach a specific point can be as eventful as watching the neon stripes on your rover dry. The paint job will be worth it, but isn't it better to rush to the end? Skip ahead to the good stuff using a time warp. Like I said earlier, the highest point of our orbit is called the apoapsis. The lowest point of our orbit is known as the periapsis. By default, your camera is focused on your vessel. So if you can't see either of these points, adjust your camera. <coughs> well, we have to do this ourselves, do we? Scroll the middle mouse wheel to zoom in and out. Double click an object to center your camera on it. Click the middle mouse button to enter free cam. Press home to reset. Excellent! You can time warp to any position on your trajectory by selecting a point on your vehicle's current path, and then selecting Time Warp to Point. Now you're way up in the sky, so high that if you circularize your orbit now, you'll be in high orbit. Wow, the black starry void looks so small from here. Here we go. <coughs> we 
just burn the other way to uh, circularize. From command pods to space probe cores, a lot of critical rocket parts use electric charge. You'll want to design your rocket so it can generate and store EC. I see solar panels and batteries. Most rocket engines generate electric charge while active, but we'll still need a way to keep our batteries full while coasting between maneuvers. Solar panels convert Kerbal's light into EC for our rockets. Small solar panels can just be placed, but large solar panels are delicate and must only be deployed once we're out of the atmosphere. I've equipped this rocket with two deployable solar panels. Here's a hand crank. Get to work. But looking at this, and I've just noticed, I hope Valentina's feeling sort of not really secure in herself because this rocket is very ballistic. <laughs> There's no parachutes. <laughs> just kidding. There's a handy button that opens all of them with a single click. Give it a try. Great. The solar panels are now extended. Light tracking solar panels only rotate on one axis, so we may need to reorient our ship to point them fully at the sun. Let's make sure the panels are getting direct sunlight by rolling our ship a little bit. Excellent. The solar panels are soaking up all of those sweet photons and giving our rockets some much needed EC. You can see the status of any solar panel within the part manager in the electrical parts menu. You can either access the app directly by clicking the app button, or you can right click a part to directly access it in the part manager. Nice. Getting EC is one thing, and storing it is another. Most command pods have a small battery, but many missions will call for additional EC storage. When we're traveling far from the sun or going to the dark side of a planet, more batteries means more peace of mind. There's four on this tiny rocket that doesn't even have a parachute. Next on. At some point, the crew will run out of snacks. Did you know a Kerbal is 99.9% .9 more likely to crash when hungry? That's when it's time to head back down to Kerbin, a planet known for its plentiful snack options. First, let's get a better view for this operation. No solar panels, but we do finally have a parachute for Valentina. Remember how we burned prograde to raise our orbit? To lower our orbit, we burn now flip retrograde, the opposite direction to our rocket's movement. When we get into position to fire our engine backward, all right, the rocket is aligned to retrograde. Increase the throttle and burn until our trajectory is just past the atmosphere. As we decelerate, watch what's happening to our periapsis. Once it enters the atmosphere, this rocket is on a path back to the ground. Don't ease off the throttle yet, though. We're going to keep burning until our trajectory intercepts the ground. This should give us a good idea. That's it. Let's stop our burn. Now that we're on a collision course with Kerbin, we need to turn that collision into something more survivable. This process of crashing without dying is called landing. Our upcoming stage will activate a decoupler, dropping the engine and exposing a very important heat shield. Why don't you do that now? My staging rocket, we press space. There Great. we go. We're on our way down and our heat shield is exposed. Have you ever wondered what a marshmallow feels like when it catches on fire? You're about to find out. Okie dokie. I guess that's the next tutorial. Oops, I didn't mean to click replay. I suppose we could have watched it. At some point, the crew will run out of snacks. Did you know a Kerbal is 99.9? There we go. <clears throat> we could have watched the rocket come down, but uh, we'll leave that for more uh, exploratory fun. Uh, orbital transfers. Orbital 
transfers. As you know, the faster you go, the higher your orbit gets. If you get moving fast enough, your orbit may cross the orbit of some other object, like a moon or a planet. The closest celestial body to Kerbin is the Mun. If you're looking for somewhere else, <laughs> it's a very depressed looking Mun. The Mun is a good choice. The real trick to getting there is timing your departure so that the Mun captures your vehicle at its highest point. If you mistime your departure, you may miss the Mun entirely, which creates a lot of paperwork. Oh dear. Let's assume you've left at the right time and the Mun is there to meet you. As your vessel approaches the Mun, it enters a zone in which the Mun's gravitational influence on your orbit is stronger than Kerbin's. This zone is called the Mun's sphere of influence. You've had to go very quickly to escape Kerbin's gravity, much too fast for the Mun's low gravity to capture you. If you don't slow down, your vehicle will speed past the Mun and be flung farther into space. Remember what I said about paperwork? Once you're in the Mun's gravity well, the best way to slow down is to fire your engines backwards until your trajectory becomes a nice, stable orbit. Now you're a moon of the Mun! So now we get to learn how to do a transfer. A Hochman transfer, I believe it's called. I wonder if she'll say that in the tutorial. Our rocket is in orbit over Kerbin and ready to fly. The mission today is to, drum roll please, intercept and orbit the Mun. To be captured by the Mun's gravity, our vessel must cross into the Mun's sphere of influence, or SOI. The zone in which its gravity is stronger than any other celestial body around it. We're going to create a maneuver plan to figure out when and how long we need to fire our engines to intercept the Mun. Great! Now here's a new trick. We can select any object as a target in map view. Targeting gives us useful information and enables new tools. Once we've targeted a celestial body or other object in space, our maneuver will provide closest pass and plane angle information. This can be very helpful for meeting up with someone or something in space. Right now, our camera is following our vessel as it orbits Kerbin. Let's adjust our camera until we can see the MUN. Then, right-click to target it. We want to place this maneuver plan with two things in mind. First, the MUN is in motion. We can't aim our spacecraft where the MUN is right now. Instead, we have to aim where the Mun will be after our vehicle has coasted all the way from Kerbin. Second, remember how increasing velocity raises the opposite side of our orbit? Since we're placing this maneuver plan where we intend to start our burn, we should place it on the opposite side of Kerbin from where we intend to intercept the Mun. Placing a maneuver plan usually involves making a best guess and then fiddling with the maneuver until you get an intercept. Fortunately, you've got a crack navigator with you today. By my calculations, we'll want to put our maneuver here. Excellent! We've just created a maneuver plan. While we could find out if our departure timing is correct by just picking a direction and maxing the throttle, a maneuver plan tells us in advance how much delta V we'll need, how long we'll need to burn, and in what direction our vessel will need to point during the maneuver. Grab and pull the arrows to plan a burn along that direction. This maneuver is pretty simple. We want to burn prograde and expand our orbit. Nice! That maneuver event towards the end of your trajectory is exactly what we're looking for. It tells that if we execute this plan, we'll intercept the MUN. There we go. If a maneuver looks right, but we're not getting the intercept we expect, we can change the starting position of the maneuver by grabbing and dragging the middle of the maneuver plan along our orbit. It's very common to refine a maneuver plan by adjusting both the position of the maneuver and the direction of the planned burn.
If we don't want to maneuver at all, we can delete the plan, either by right-clicking the gizmo and selecting delete, or through the burn timer. Maneuvers are invaluable when leaving Kerbin. Feel free to come back. So they've improved the maneuvering over a bit, so we can see the like the proper time to start the burn now, and how long we've got to burn for. No more uh, maths required, or not nearly as much maths required anyway. We've got a maneuver plan that intercepts the Mun. Now we just need to execute that maneuver and fly to the Mun ourselves. Whenever we have a maneuver plan, a burn timer will appear. The timer shows you how much time is left until we need to execute the maneuver. I've paused the simulation for a moment, so this number won't count down quite yet. The timer also tells us how long we'll need to burn our engines at 100% throttle in order to complete the maneuver. Now let's take a look at the nav ball. A new marker has joined our old prograde and retrograde markers. This is called a maneuver marker, and it shows us the orientation of our planned maneuver. We'll want to make sure that this marker is in the center of our nav ball during our maneuver burn. Luckily, we can aim at this maneuver marker by selecting the maneuver button on your SAS controls. Now your vehicle is properly oriented, and through the magic of SAS and more math than I'd like to admit, our vessel is properly oriented. We're still far from our planned burn, so let's speed things up. While we could rely on our reflexes to time warp at the perfect moment, a less stressful alternative is warping to a specific point in our orbit. See this button? Select it to warp automatically to the moment. Departure burn, here we come. Here we go. Great! We've exited just before our maneuver burn, and I've paused the simulation once more. After we select continue, remember to wait until the countdown reaches zero. Then we'll go full throttle until our burn timer reaches zero. Then cut the throttle quickly to avoid overshooting our target. Okay, get ready to hit the throttle. Twenty-five seconds. I do like these tutorials. It's a nice refresher, and it, it is very good at introducing new players to Kerbal. Though obviously the more advanced stuff people are going to watch on YouTube anyway. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, eat! And go. Watch the burn timer. We want to stop our burn once it reaches zero. Again, Valentina is feeling very ballistic because no more parachutes or landers or anything. Everything's looking great. Cut the throttle. That lasted a little bit longer, maybe because I was slow on the throttle. Great work. You've successfully executed a maneuver, and now we're on our way to the mud. So it's still not perfect. It's going to take a while to reach the mud, but don't let the weight fool you. We're now moving faster than any Kerbal has ever flown before. When we enter the Mun's sphere of influence, we'll be going way too fast for the Mun's gravity to capture our vehicle. To orbit the Mun, we'll need to burn retrograde once we're inside its SOI, or sphere of influence. This will slow us down enough to keep us from being whipped into interplanetary space. Let's start by time warping until we're within the Mun's sphere of influence. 
That's the sphere within which the MUN is the primary gravitational influence on your vehicle. Let's get a little bolder with our time warp this time. I do like how they've added the sphere of influence markers. Farewell, Kerbin. We'll miss you. Welcome to the Mun's Sphere of Influence. Let's slow down to normal time so we can create our capture maneuver. Did you notice that we've got a periapsis above the Mun, but no apoapsis? That's because we're going too fast to complete an orbit before sailing past the Mun. Don't worry, we have time to adjust. Our objective is to slow down enough so that both apoapsis and periapsis are within the Mun's Sphere of Influence. Remember the rule of orbital opposites. Because we want to lower your apoapsis, in order to reduce our apoapsis, we need to slow down by burning backwards or retrograde. This is a little like deorbiting over Kerbin, but we're going to stop burning before our trajectory meets Mun dust. Maneuver plan set. Next up, let's make sure we're pointed where we need to be. If the maneuver is right, and we're pointed in the right direction, now we need to time warp to the right position. And we're on our way. There's the mud. Almost there. When the countdown reaches zero, throttle up to start your capture burn. 36 seconds. Oh, that looks cool in the game engine. A little light halo coming off Kerbin, even in this little pixelated simulation. Seventeen, sixteen, fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, twelve, eleven, ten. 16, 15, 14, 15, 11, 10. I do like how it gives you the uh, little sort of Formula One uh, race start icons. Four, three, two, one, zero. Keep burning until the burn timer reaches zero. Shut the engines now. We have an orbit. Fantastic. That was some fancy flying. Looks to me like you're about ready to try this for real. Nice. End tutorial. And I think that is all the tutorials that are in the game right now. Go back to the training center just to check, and it is. So now we can do what we need to do. Tracking station, the launch pad. We'll have a quick look in the uh, assembly building to see if we've got some safe rockets. And we do, so we do have some stock Kerbal rockets. Reaching Kerbal orbit, going to the Mund or Minmus. So let's fire one of these up. Actually, we'll just do an orbit one for a laugh. So we can see what the game actually looks like and I get to tweak my graphics settings a bit better. So graphics, there we go. Good stuff. So it does look a bit sort of shinier now. We have our kerbals, I assume. I can't see where our kerbals are in this view. Never mind. We've got some batteries, some solar panels. This thing does look about ready to go. We can change the colour, can't we? <clears throat> Should make our rocket bright red. There we go. <laughs> oh, and the accent as well. That's quite cool. Uh, yellow. Make it like go faster stripes. There we go. That looks like an Iron Man rocket. Staging is all good. Let's go and have some fun. Oh, we've got Bill, not Jebediah. 
So the frame rate is not bad, but it could be better. You'll notice that the frame rate can be a bit of whack. But let's go. I want to go east. Yep. Okie dokie. <laughs> they actually give you a countdown. <laughs> I do like the music. Oh, I botched it. I botched it. I botched it. I double tap space. <laughs> we'll try that again. Oh, that was a disaster. Poor Bill. I double tap space. I I'm blaming COVID. We'll try that again. The plumes and everything look fantastic. Frame rate's a bit wibbly, not gonna lie. How are we doing? I'm gonna sort of get to 100k. Out there. Frame rate was a little bit funny, and it, there was a little bit of lag sort of switching between the screens, like the map view. Get this thing pointed prograde. I think we can dump the larger stage now, we're kind of where we want to be. Tin can in an Iron Man rocket. Just getting up to sort of a hundred now. Just before we get to our apoapsis. <clears throat> so yeah, it's a little frame rate like it. The things I've noticed that people have been saying is that rockets with lots and lots and lots and lots of parts can make the game very laggy. There's definitely some um, frame rate dropping going on. 
and I'm not using a very light PC. You know, my PC can run Star Citizen pretty well, and I'm running a 3060 Ti. So, mixed bag. I have to see. Getting there. We're running low on fuel though. There's our periapsis. And that'll do. 108, 192. Not perfect, but we're in orbit. Our first Kerbal spaceship in orbit. We're not using Jebediah. I wonder if Jeb retired. We don't have any extendable solar panels because we've got lots around the outside of the spaceship. And spin this thing around. And we have to do a little EVA. There we go. Okay, we've got a little EVA pack. Controls are the same as before. That's good to know. He's <laughs> oh wow, have they got like they've got magnetic boots. They haven't. Oh, they haven't. <laughs> he was just able to stand on the spaceship. <laughs> Hang on. No, they have. They've got mag boots. That's amazing. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. Either that or it's a game. It's a bug in the game. But either way, it's a bug I'm hoping that they keep. Oh no, we can just grab the uh, the rocket there. Jetpack. Sweet. And now he's back in his spaceship. No science to gather, which feels a bit strange, but it's not in the game yet. You can see the time warp going. Telling us that the solar panels aren't as effective because there's no sun, which is quite cool. We sort of zoomed around the other side of the planet, about there. Oh, I didn't quite mean to unpause it with a million notifications. We are retrograde, so we'll burn some more. out there and see if we can get us to come down somewhere near the KSP. It's a very pretty sunrise. The game does look fantastic compared to the original Kerbal, I've got to say, even with like mods and things. But yeah, the, the uh, cost of that is frame rate for what it seems to be at the minute with the new engine. I'm sure someone or the developers will sort of cushed it up to make it act a lot better. 98k. We sort of wait till we get to about 75 and then we'll jettison. Oh, millions of notifications. There goes our booster. Here comes some atmosphere. We haven't seen the re-entry yet. We turn the SAS off. And we'll let the pod sort of spin a little bit because then we'll know when we get some atmospheric braking. Atmosphere. 
Just not the dense part yet. <clears throat> I do love the indicator that shows us which way we're pointing. There we go. That thing's definitely slowing down a bit more because it's got more mass. There we go. Now we're starting to slow down. Looks like a um, a salvage icon for Star Citizen for the uh, extra rocket part over there. This is where the dense part is. We've seen no re-entry plumes yet. Where's our big shiny re-entry plume? I can see like the feet of a Kerbal. That's a bit disappointing. I wonder if it's an option. Everything's set to high. Yeah, that's a bit disappointing. I was hoping to see a big sexy rocket plume. Well, well not do the KSC. We're uh, dumping Bill in the middle of the desert, which is a bit unfortunate, but at least it'll be warm. Thousand meters. This is a bit higher above sea level, I think. This is getting very close. Oh dear. Oh no, there we go. Just in time. little spaceship onto the desert floor. Implant flag. Trust. 
There's no point planting a flag here, it does seem a bit silly, doesn't it? Can't take the helmets off though. And no parachutes? Doesn't look like it. Never mind. Oh well. Oh, Bill's happy he's doing a little dance. Look at that. <laughs> well, there we go. That's some Kerbal Space Program 2 tutorials. Um, I'm looking forward to experimenting with it a bit. I hope they can sort out the little FPS drops and stuff we've been having. I imagine there's going to be something similar to a day one patch very soon uh, because of they, they've said in interviews that when everyone is playing this game and they have thousands upon thousands of you know people playing it there's going to be things that they can find that they can fix naturally that's how Star Citizen and many many other games are done when they get launched and get day one patches I'm hoping they fix the uh, re-entry plume I was really looking forward to a re-entry plume I'll have to experiment a bit and see if we can get some more but yeah that's the tutorials and the first quick mission into space so thank you very very much for watching everybody I hope everybody has a good time I hope everybody's feeling a lot better than I am right now because I'm full of COVID but yeah We'll get maybe some more KSP if you guys like this, and uh, definitely some more Star Citizen. I'll see you all next time. Thank you for watching, everyone, and I hope you enjoyed. If you like this and think I deserve it, please give it a like. Consider subbing if you fancy sticking around. If you're thinking of taking part in the game, feel free to use my referral code on screen or click the link below for bonus in game money that helps me out as well. See you in the next one.